What's he doing when he does this? Righto, so in booking terms and also I guess in kayfabe, he is the big dog. I'm Adam, hailing from Parts Fun Known, and let's talk about Roman Reigns. How long have you got? Let's start by saying that right now, as of recording this, Roman Reigns is off WWE TV and probably will be for quite some time because owing to his leukemia, he's immunocompromised. He's more at risk in this time than most other people. So I think it's great that he is prioritizing himself over WWE Stay Safe Roman. That well wishing to the person being put to one side, I think it's safe to say that most people have a relationship with Roman Reigns, the character that can be summarized. Well, let's just say they'd rather shove a boiling tea Pot up their cock than see him win a world championship. Get out of here, you bog dog. Oh, I, I like him. Now for me, the T is that actually I'm not one of those people. I think Roman Reigns is really great. He carries himself like a superstar. He cuts a decent promo these days. He's a good boy. Who's a good boy? You're a good boy. You're a good boy. See, like my father who hasn't changed his suitcase in 25 years, Roman Reigns carries with him a lot of toxic baggage. Which is a shame because there's someone very human, very deep inside the trademark of Roman Reigns and his name is Joe. Joe, the brief time that we saw him, was an unironic superhero. He punked out cancer, he spoke eloquently and humbly, and also he didn't dress like Action Man's MySpace phase. The shock of Joe revealing that he was suffering from leukemia was the cold splash of water across all of our faces that we so desperately needed to make that red mist clear and see a human being standing in front of us. Now we haven't seen Joe for quite a while and once again a vocal part of the fan base, not as big as it used to be, Roman's generally getting better reactions than he used to, but a vocal part of the fan base still has that anyone but you attitude to Roman Reigns in the main event, despite the fact that the bog dog hasn't won a world championship in a year and a half. And the thing is really at the heart of it, people don't hate Roman Reigns. If anything, they hate John Cena. And they don't really hate John Cena. If anything, they hate Hulk Hogan. And if anything, they actually hate this idea that WWE has to be built around one guy. The idea that there has to be a chosen one, someone who is put in the main event because of design rather than because of circumstances. Because this way, the audience doesn't get a chance to participate in the conversation. Someone catches fire and that could all be for nothing because the WrestleMania main event has been set in Congress with Roman Reigns being a part of it for the fifth or sixth year in a row. And that feels unnatural and like, why would we invest our time in this? That one guy tentpole system is a system that Roman's been wrapped up in since June 2nd, 2014, when the shield imploded, thanks to the sudden and nasal betrayal of someone who fell asleep on a yellow park bench before the painter dried. And something that I think a lot of people constantly forget is in June 2014, Roman Reigns was cool. I'm not. He was popular, he dominated to a great reaction at Survivor Series 2013. Uh, at the Royal Rumble, he was one of the final two and he got a gigantic babyface reaction when compared to Batista. Yet one year later at Royal Rumble 2015, he was being booed like he'd shat on a flag. What, what happened? Well, straight off the bat, they made a couple of really weird decisions that didn't make Roman Reigns seem like a human and more like a corporate project. First of all, with no explanation, he was the one who got to keep all the shield stuff. He got to keep the music, he got to keep his stupid vest. Why does it have a Spider-Man on the front? And so despite him winning the breakup, he was the only one that didn't also then get into a really heated feud with another shield mate about it. WWE distanced Roman from the shield breakup narrative whilst also giving him all of the brand stuff that they as a group had made popular. And fans notice. It's like if One Direction broke up because Niall killed Louis, and then Niall and Liam have this bitter feud, but Harry Styles doesn't get involved in that. Instead, he just keeps producing music as if nothing's happened, and also he keeps calling himself One Direction. It's really weird, and the fans notice, because WWE fans may be many things. They may be impatient, uh, resentful, overdramatic, but they're not f blind. The next pay-per-view after The Shield broke up, Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, they fought in the ladder match for the Money in the Bank briefcase, whereas Roman Reigns was shunted up the card into the ladder match for the vacant WWE World Heavyweight Championship, and there's the writing on the wall right there. While Ambrose and Rollins were battering each other in an emotional feud that ran from Money in the Bank all the way down to Hell in a Cell, Roman Reigns fought for the top championship again at Battleground, then he had an underwhelming match with Randy Orton at SummerSlam, and then, to WWE's credit, he was supposed to fight Seth one-on-one -on -one at Night of Champions before he went out with a herniated rib and he was out 
for most of the year. He did come back in time to collect his Superstar of the Year Slammy though. In 2014, WrestleMania 30 had happened that year and Roman Reigns was Superstar of the Year. Not this guy, not him, Roman Reigns. It just felt off. And not just that, WWE started to change the way Roman Reigns cut promos. Now, a lot of people have it in their head that Roman Reigns was a really bad promo in 2014. And he's not, he's decent at being himself. Go back and watch some old Shield promos at the time. Granted, Dean Ambrose is the man on the stick, but Roman Reigns was really good at being a quiet, simmering badass. Like that time he told Roddy Piper, if you ever touch me again, I'm gonna break your old ass in half. Like, I, I believe you, Roman. I believe you will tear my bottom in twain. It's a persona that Roman Reigns was really good at because he'd spent the last two years cultivating it. But then, once the WWE separated him from Dean and Seth, they made the baffling decision to change his attitude to being that of f***ing Bugs Bunny. He started cutting promos, calling his opponents sniveling little suck-up sellouts full of suffering succotash, son, also referring to people's junk as tater tots. What the f*** is that? For Roman Reigns to go from an actually charismatic, actually cool thug badass like me to a cloying stand-up comedian who practices his tight five on his opponent's dick. That is a jarring betrayal of everything Roman Reigns was and the fans noticed this stuff. The WWE fans may be many things. They may be reactionary, cruel, smelly, but they're not f***ing death. And then WWE made the fatal error in the push of Roman Reigns to a main event talent. They brought Daniel Bryan back before the Royal Rumble 2015. See, at its absolute simplest, what happened to Roman is that at a very specific point in time, he wasn't Daniel Bryan and WWE fans have never forgiven him for it. On June 9th, just a week after the Shield imploded, Daniel Bryan vacated the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and went to have neck surgery. For anyone who had followed his long, long journey to WrestleMania 30, this was a heartbreaking development. When it became obvious that Daniel Bryan would be out for the rest of the year, WWE very smartly decided to put their belt on Brock Lesnar, who in 2014, let's not forget, was not the cynical finish spammer that he is today, but rather a proper marquee main event talent. And not only that, he got the belt by squashing John Cena. That was interesting. It was different. So fans were like, okay, WWE, let's see what you got. But then the rumors came out that Brock Lesnar's contract would be running out at WrestleMania 31. So obviously a new champion would be crowned. In January 2015, before the Royal Rumble, Daniel Bryan returned and suddenly, You've got your story. Fans had their superhero back and a perfect underdog comeback narrative to slot him right into. Daniel Bryan was snubbed from the 2014 Royal Rumble. He tore his way into the main event and then lost the championship without even losing it. A year later, he returns before the Royal Rumble. He is announced for that match. All he has to do is win it. Go on to WrestleMania, have the purest example of a David versus Goliath story that WWE had on their plate at that time, and then out-wrestle Brock at Mania, win the championship once again, the championship that he never lost. It's too, it, like how, it, it's perfect. It's perfect. Were it not for the fact that WWE have this system of one guy, one dependable guy that they can put on the poster every single year and Daniel Bryan had got hurt. He had had to give up the belt. He was no longer dependable. He'd had his moment. It was time for someone else. No matter that the story was perfect for Daniel Bryan, Roman Reigns was now the chosen one. He was John Cena. He was Hulk Hogan. And therefore, boo. During the 2015 Rumble, Daniel Bryan was eliminated really early on with the hopes that the fans would grieve, get over it, and then be like, right, now I'm all in on Roman Reigns. That did not happen though. What actually happened was fans felt like they'd seen something they really cared about being lowered slowly into a thresher and then ruined the rest of the Royal Rumble with booze, treating Roman Reigns especially like he'd personally and slowly run over their favorite pet with his golf cart. The fans even booed the celebrity movie man with the big arms and the nice smile. That picture of The Rock, this picture of The Rock holding Roman Reigns' hand in the air while so angry and confused as to why they hate his dog cousin. It, it, it's baff. I love this picture. Look how cross the movie man is. It is the perfect encapsulation of WWE's willful ignorance to the Daniel Bryan storyline. It's The Rock! 
Why are you booing? Should we have eliminated Daniel Bryan even earlier? What do you want? Stop chanting Daniel Bryan and tell us what you want. This is a toxic baggage that Roman has never recovered from and it's not his fault. There just comes a point where if you dismiss all of the reactions you're getting from the crowd, that renders all storytelling inert. And once a storyline is dead, even if you do everything right, even if the performers do everything right, you just don't care about it. So yeah, Roman Reigns, was pushed very heavily. He got big reactions because reactions are all that WWE cares about, despite the fact that the reactions never actually served the story they were trying to tell in the first place. And we had to watch our screens again after CM Punk and Daniel Bryan made us think we're out of the senior years. Once again, we were watching someone being pushed that we didn't want at that time. And everyone was booing and the commentators all had selective hearing loss to the chance. And we we're like, we, we, it's the twilight zone. We've gone mad again. WWE tried to put the fire out at Fastlane a month later by having Roman Reigns put his mania shot on the line versus Daniel Bryan, which made Daniel Bryan seem like an entitled dick and made a sham of the Royal Rumble. But everything's on fire at this point, so who the f*** cares? That match was great. Roman Reigns is a really good wrestler. Roman won clean. Daniel Bryan then explicitly handed in the torch. He did everything short of turning to the camera and saying, please, Vince McMahon is so angry. Stop booing the dog. But the fans were galvanized. They were not going to back down from this particular fight because they'd been hurt before. And then at WrestleMania 31, WWE faced an impossible choice. Do we have Brock Lesnar, who just re-signed, retain and therefore the heel wins at WrestleMania? Or do we have someone that the fans actually hate win at WrestleMania? And God help them, like they always do, WWE book themselves into a corner and then book their way out perfectly. Seth Rollins ran and cashed in money in the bank, turned the match into a triple threat and then ran away as fast as little yellow tinged legs could carry him. Apparently the decision to have Seth win it was a very last minute decision and Roman Reigns' family got really angry and almost kicked off backstage. That's not funny, you shouldn't laugh at that. With their fingers severely burned from this whole thing, WWE slid Roman Reigns back down the card. They gave Seth the spotlight, they awarded Roman Reigns a few losses here or there, the occasional victory. He had a really good last man standing match with the big show at Extreme Rules. Then he lost a fatal four way at Payback. He lost a Money in the Bank match at Money in the Bank. He lost to Bray Wyatt at Battleground. I mean, say what you want, but WWE really cooled their shit on the whole Reigns wins lol thing. Roman and Ambrose finally tagged together on pay-per-view at SummerSlam, beating the Wyatt family, and then again at Night of Champions when they lost to the Wyatt family. After finally blowing off his feud with Bray Wyatt at Hell in a Cell, WWE thought, right, that's enough of a cooling off period. Daniel Bryan's nowhere in sight. Let's push the dog again. Seth went out sick, so they had a championship tournament. Problem was, during that championship tournament, Ambrose got more over than Reigns. Reigns won that, and then they teased Ambrose for some reason, again, winning the championship all the way through Road to WrestleMania, but he didn't make it to WrestleMania, Reigns did, and then he won versus Triple H. He finally was coronated, and the fans replied, f***ing boo forever. Cool, said WWE. Sounds about right. Some people have justified the hate by saying that Roman Reigns was pushed too soon and that his capabilities didn't justify his presentation and well, it's certainly his capabilities to be what WWE wanted him to be weren't there. He wasn't John Cena. He was something cooler than that. But in reality, he became world champion two and a half years after his main roster debut. That is later than Kurt Angle, The Rock, Brock Lesnar, even Randy Orton, none of them received the wholesale rejection that Reigns received because none of those guys were made the guy in such illogical, confusing and anger inducing circumstances. And give me a go. Right off the bat, let's clear one thing up right away. The solution to all of this is not a Roman Reigns heel turn. Don't get me wrong, once it became obvious that the push had failed, that he wasn't what WWE wanted him to be, then absolutely they should have listened to the fans and turned him heel. If they had done that in 2015, Roman Reigns would have gone through the heel process and actually probably emerged as a legitimate and cool baby face once again by now. And fans really did latch onto it because after all, a heel turn or a face turn is a chance to rebrand a character and that was the only thing Roman Reigns ever really needed after The Shield broke up. He needed a rebrand. And not even a radical one, like he should have still been himself. He should, 
shouldn't have been the one-man shield, the only dog left from the Hounds of Justice. Strip away the shield stuff, let him be good at what he's good at, i.e. wrestling a strong, powerful, high-octane style, being simmeringly charismatic, and let that be his character going forward. If the fans don't respond to it, fine, turn him heel. And if they do, well, hey, job done. Like, for the world's seemingly most unsolvable problem, it's blindingly simple. The only thing that's getting in your way is this idea that you have to have Roman Reigns be the guy because there has to be the guy. So we begin the night after payback 2014. It's the destruction of the shield and actually it plays out exactly as it was going to. There may be a temptation to make Dean Ambrose the heel, the person who explodes the shield because they had also been teasing that tension between him and Roman Reigns earlier on in that year. But in actuality, Rollins was by far the best choice. He was the most unexpected. He was gifted in the ring. He was gifted on the microphone and he had a persona that suited, that sort of intelligent architect persona, suited being a cunning heel all the more. Keep the betrayal exactly as it happened, but change the fallout of it significantly. To put it in its simplest terms, Roman Reigns needs to give more of a shit about the shield ending, because it was like a year and a half of his life. These people were his brothers. He shouldn't be going off and fighting for trinkets. He should be following his brother, Dean Ambrose, and making sure that Triple H and Seth Rollins getting their comeuppance is his number one priority. After the betrayal, stick Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose together like glue. Have them become the brothers, but not have them be a tag team, which again is nicely ironic because it felt like these two, their tension earlier in the year, that was the thing that was gonna make the shield explode. And so for the rest of the calendar year, we're gonna keep Dean and Roman on the same level on the card. This has two main benefits. One, Dean Ambrose does most of the talking, whereas Roman Reigns gets to just stand there and just sort of simmer with his jaw and his lovely beard and his, and his, nice, and his nice vest. Not the padded one, but like, you know, the nice kind of tight, black vest. He's a handsome man. He is a, he is a handsome man. You know, he gets to tell people, I'm going to break your bottom in half. Wee Only not shit. And number two, it nullifies the idea that Roman Reigns is being pushed over his other teammates. The next pay-per-view is Money in the Bank and all three former Shield members go into the ladder match for the briefcase. This allows for a glimmer of what we're all building towards, which is the Shield triple threat. However, because there's so many other people involved because it's a ladder match, you don't give away that match entire. Reigns and Ambrose work together in this match to clear out most of the shield. It's clear that they are a brotherhood. They are family. They keep going after Seth Rollins, but he keeps managing to get his squirrely ass out of dodge. Except Seth Rollins finally makes a mistake. While he thinks everyone else is down, he climbs that ladder, reaches for the briefcase and looks down and sees Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose standing at the bottom. They pick up the ladder, they run towards the ropes and they throw him, he leaps from the ladder through the Spanish announce table. However, despite Roman and Dean's best efforts, Seth's goons, Kane and Randy Orton show up and each of them cost one of the brothers. This opens the door for Seth Rollins to actually win the Money in the Bank briefcase like he did in real life because it's a heel prop and he is a perfect sneaky chicken heel and that's what the briefcase is there. The next night on Raw, Seth Rollins tries to cash in on new champ Cena when he's waylaid by Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. Ambrose gets on the mic and tells Seth Rollins, you're a marked man, brother. I can't do a Dean Ambrose impression. You're a brother. Uh, you're gonna go to hell with me, brother. I'm Dean Ambrose and I'm crazy. I'm lucky to have this job. Anyway, he says, you're a marked man, Seth. Anytime you poke your head above the parapet, we're gonna shoot you down. And Romans just say, strong, silent, very handsome, and just mouth. Scared out of his mind, Seth Rollins begs Triple H to have Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose taken out. Triple H obliges and instructs Kane and Randy Orton to take out Team Romain. That episode of Raw ends with Kane and Randy Orton placing each member of the brothers on Seth Rollins' shoulders and he power bombs both of them again and again and again. So at Battleground, this leads to a three on two elimination handicap match, Seth, Kane and Randy Orton versus Roman and Dean. It's elimination because that way pretty much everyone can get a pin for apart from Kane, but that's okay because he's grandpa. Ambrose pins Kane after dirty deeds and immediately pops up into an RKO from Randy Orton. And this is where we start to get the very first glimmer of Roman Reigns as a main eventer. He is down two on one 
but he fights from underneath. He manages to eliminate Randy Orton after a spear and it looks like he's got Seth Rollins' number. He is going to win this by himself for his team. However, as he runs for a spear, Randy Orton pops in from out of nowhere while the referee is distracted by Kane, I guess, Grandpa. Reigns is planted with an RKO and then Seth Rollins follows it up with a curb stomp. Seth Rollins gets the pin. Roman Reigns had the opportunity to do a John Cena, so we're starting to see him in that framework, but he ultimately came up short for logical reasons. The numbers game and also their dicks. You're establishing him as a potential superhero, but you're not handing him constant wins. After battle, ground, Reigns and Ambrose up the ante and recreate one of the best angles that the Shield ever did, which is basically they want something and they're going to kill everyone backstage until they get it. They just walk around smashing heels through catering, smashing heels through TV screens they're trying to do interviews. And they say, this is going to keep happening until we get what we want, which is us versus Seth Rollins and Triple H at SummerSlam. Oh, and by the way, we want it. No holds. But Triple H initially refuses. He remembers what happened to Extreme Rules and Payback, so he tries to have them escorted from the building because of all those murders that they did. However, they escape, they run through the crowd, but not before promising this will keep happening. And indeed, next week, it happens again. The week after that, it happens again. They are becoming a huge problem. So finally, Triple H relents and agrees as Seth Rollins' new boyfriend to beat up his old boyfriends. We've all been there. Side note, by the way, at no point during this feud should Roman or Dean be commandeering a hot dog cart and spraying Seth Rollins with mustard or stealing his briefcase and filling it with get your own back style gunge. They shouldn't do that because that's shit. That's why, because it's shit. So we get the No Holds Barred match at SummerSlam and finally Reigns and Ambrose get a chance to get their hands on Triple H and Seth Rollins and they munch them. Roman gets another slight little Superman moment. He's going for a spear on Seth Rollins, but Triple H pops out of nowhere, nails him in the head with a sledgehammer, but Roman Reigns kicks out at two and Triple H does a what face that everyone does after every kick out these days. <laughs> <laughs> Reigns and Ambrose get Rollins up for a double powerbomb through the announce table, leaving Triple H, the mastermind behind the breakup of the Shield, all by himself. He tries to pedigree Dean Ambrose, who hoofs him in the dick, and then he rolls out of the way while Roman Reigns with a spear. One, two, three. Vengeance is the brothers. And you know what? Roman hits the spear, but as he's doing the pin, Dean Ambrose jumps on top, so they both get the visual pin because that's nice. Also at SummerSlam, Brock Lesnar destroys John Cena to become WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Keep that the same because it was awesome. So as we approach Night of Champions, that's when we revert a little bit back to the booking that they did in real life because at this time, Roman Reigns went out with a herniated rib. Now I could make the argument that, you know, injuries are a wrong time, wrong place situation. So if you do a different place and a different time, then the injuries might not happen, but that does feel like a cheat. And actually I don't need to cheat at this point. So I would have Roman Reigns go out, leaving Dean Ambrose versus Seth Rollins as that storyline going forward. No more Triple H, just Dean and Seth. Do what they did in real life. Have Seth Rollins take out Dean with the stomp through the very, very fake cinder blocks. Then Dean turns up at Night of Champions after Roman Reigns is forced to forfeit, leading to Hell in the Cell. Once again, I would have them main event. It was a brilliant match. And I also so this may be controversial, but I cut the spooky ass Bray Wyatt hologram from the end. I would have Seth Rollins just cheat to win and not do the Obi-Wan, you're our only hope nonsense. Scrap the ghost, scrap the entire Dean Ambrose uh, Bray Wyatt feud, have Dean lose, but have that play over into Survivor Series. Since Roman Reigns is still out with an injury, we stick to mostly the same booking, which is Team Authority versus Team John Cena, again, another match of the year, only replace Dolph Ziggler in that match with Dean Ambrose. We also give Ambrose that final moment of that pay-per-view. After yet another heel turn from Big Show, Dean Ambrose is the only one left on his team in a three-on-one advantage. He manages to fight out. He plants Luke Harper with dirty deeds. He manages to roll up Kane when it's finally Dean versus Seth. Once again, out comes Triple H, out comes Sting. And then after everyone has sort of been waylaid, Dean and Seth rise to their feet. Ambrose manages to catch him with dirty deeds 
and he pinned Seth Rollins one, two, three to officially disband the authority for like a month. The additional benefit to Ambrose getting this victory is that by now, because they've been kept on relatively the same level up until this point, fans should hopefully be clamoring for Roman Reigns to get his moment. So after Survivor Series, Dean Ambrose enters into a feud with Kane and The Big Show, who's recently just allied himself with the Authority, who are currently nowhere to be seen. Oh no, it's chaos. Not knowing exactly what to do, the two henchmen without men to hench start just pissing on Dean Ambrose's chips. After a while, Dean Ambrose says, okay, you, you, want, you want me? I can't do it. You want me at TLC? That was the first time, two years ago, at TLC pay-per-view, The Shield fought on pay-per-view for the first time in a TLC match. We're gonna do it again. It's gonna be Big Show and Kane versus Dean Ambrose and the returning Roman Reigns. And if you're starting to think, oh, have we not had enough of like, remember The Shield? then good, because we're going to start slowly introducing tension between Ambrose and Reigns before Mania when we have the big goodbye to The Shield. So naturally at the TLC pay-per-view, the hot young stars triumph over the slow moving giants. And it's just power set piece after power set piece, power bombs onto ladders, onto chairs, Roman Reigns carrying the big show in a power bomb position onto a pile of chairs. Dean Ambrose pulling Kane off a ladder into a spear in midair. Lots of fun, lots of power, and a reminder that Roman Reigns is a big main event player. Next up, the Royal Rumble 2015, AKA the time where Roman Reigns was irreversibly broken. And there are two ways to not do this. You could either not have Daniel Bryan return until after the Royal Rumble, so you don't put that narrative in people's heads, or, and this is the way I'm going, you have Daniel Bryan just win it. Do the story. It's it's right there. Now I know hindsight being 2020 20 about Daniel Bryan's health, people might be saying, what are you talking about? Don't put him in a match with Brock Lesnar. But also he wrestled a ladder match at WrestleMania 31, the closing set piece of which was him repeatedly banging his head against the head of another man. So actually, I think this might be a safer way to book Daniel Bryan. So yeah, just give people what they want. Daniel Bryan wins the Royal Rumble, goes on to face Brock Lesnar, perfect David and Goliath story. However, Dean enters the Royal Rumble, number one, because the authority have returned by this point. I've I have kept that part of the booking. The authority are back and to punish Dean Ambrose because he's the one who sent them away. You're in the Royal Rumble at number one, Billy boy. And then at number seven, really early on, we get Roman Reigns and the brothers fight and eliminate most of the field for as long as the match they can before you bring in Daniel Bryan at like 20 or so. This way you give the brothers a lot of shine without tainting that shine by having them throw hands with the people's favorite. So I'm not gonna rebook the entire Royal Rumble 2015 you that's why but here's how I would do the ending so we have the Seth Rollins John Cena Brock Lesnar triple threat earlier in the card because it's amazing one of the best triple threats if not the best triple threat WWE's ever done then backstage Seth Rollins is doing his pouty look at my cool hair whereas Triple H puts a hand on his shoulder and says don't worry Seth I he's a taxi driver from New York for some reason god he says don't worry Seth I'm I'm bad at this. He says, don't worry, Seth. Puts his hand on Seth Rollins' shoulders and says, your night is not over. So instead of that bafflingly bad end of Royal Rumble sequence, and then he just, oh no, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do this next to the rope. Roman Reigns, alley oopy goes, and then, oh, you hate it? Bring the rock out, quick. Oh, and Rusev, I guess? And Roman Reigns can win twice because people liked him winning the first time so anyway boo none of that roman and dean dominate much of the match the final four are dean ambrose roman reigns daniel bryan and the man who entered obviously number 30 seth rollins ambrose is eliminated first after being cracked over the head by seth rollins's briefcase he brings into the ring dean ambrose goes out enraged he grabs a chair comes back in and tries to hit seth but hits roman reigns instead. Roman Reigns is then eliminated from the Rumble, then it's Seth and Daniel Bryan for a while before Daniel Bryan finally eliminates Seth Rollins to win the Royal Rumble 2015. Hooray. And these are where the cracks start forming between Dean and Roman. On Raw the next night, they have a talk and they agree, you know, the brotherhood comes first, fist 
bumping, chest bumping, kissing, I don't know what friends do. With Fastlane on the horizon, Roman Reigns finally sets his sight on having a one-on-one -on -one match with Seth Rollins, because he never got that chance to properly beat him up himself. Dean had that chance, but Roman never got it. He demands a match from the authority and they decide to give it to him on one condition. They're sick of Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns being so buddy-buddy. So in fact, they can fight each other to see who gets Seth at fast lane. If either of them try and throw the match, if anyone lets themselves get pinned, they're both fired. So the two men just look at each other being like, all right, loser buys the beers and just go for it. True babyface versus babyface style. However, despite that, Packed. As soon as the bell rings, Dean Ambrose turns around <clears throat> immediately into a spear from Roman Reigns, pins him one, two, three. Roman Reigns tried to make it as quick as he possibly could, but obviously Dean Ambrose feels incredibly insulted by this and they get in each other's faces, you know, forehead to forehead, kissing. Roman holds out a fist to Dean Ambrose, who looks at it and then just slides under the ropes and walks to the back. So at fast lane, Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns fight one on one. Before the match, Ambrose tells Reigns, I want to be in your corner. But Roman Reigns says, no, look, man, I went out, okay? I want this for myself. You, you had that. You had a hell in a cell to keep other people from getting involved in the match. Just let me have this. And Dean says, fine. However, of course, does hate Seth during the match. He comes down and gets involved. This distracts the referee so much that he misses a blatant low blow from Rollins. Curb stomp, pins Roman Reigns, one, two, three, and Roman Reigns is a hot cross dog. After the match, Dean Ambrose picks Roman Reigns up saying, look, I'm sorry, bang, a spear from Roman. And Roman just stands there. He just waits for Dean Ambrose to get back to his feet. And he looks at him and he just slides under the bottom rope. And it's Roman's turn to walk angrily to the back. This all leads, because of course it does, to WrestleMania and finally, the Shield triple threat. Ambrose and Reigns have slowly imploded. Neither of them has really turned heel, but they have something to prove to each other now. And Seth is just in between them both, trying to stoke that fire for as much as he can get. The authority orders Seth to take care of his Shield brethren once and for all. And there it is. The Shield triple threat at Mania doesn't need to be any more layers to the story. So many months after the Shield broke up, we finally get that marquee match on the stage that it belongs, not necessarily at Battleground. Nine months after Seth's betrayal, after Dean Ambrose got his own very important victory over Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns spears Seth and pins him to win the Shield triple threat. During the main event, Brock Lesnar is tapped out by Daniel Bryan, and while it appears that Seth is vanquished, the next night on Raw, Seth cashes in on Daniel Bryan to become the new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. What a prick. Because, yeah, uh, that would be nuclear heat for the lad, and I don't, I really don't wanna rebook too much of Daniel Bryan's timeline. Like, I get it, again, he wasn't in a ladder match, so, who knows, but it was the darkest time of his career and I don't feel comfortable messing with that. So the night after WrestleMania, he is sent away after several curb stomps onto the briefcase by Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins pins him, becomes champion, and then we have that Seth Rollins run. And at this point, yeah, the Shield storyline is done. Everyone's moved on and everyone gets a rebrand. Roman Reigns should not be wearing his Shield colors anymore. The brothers have broken up, so they don't use their Shield theme song anymore. And Roman Reigns can go back to something maybe in more in touch with his Samoan roots, like something that Samoa Joe had. He can wear all black, sure, because yeah, he does look cool, but he can wear black trousers and like a black vest. It doesn't have to be bulletproof. So yeah, we have this different presentation of Roman. He has finally been able to lay his demons to rest and he's become his own man. He owes nothing to Dean, he owes nothing to Seth. And now we press on with him focusing not on the world title, but on the intercontinental title. Have him win that match to the next available pay-per-view. Have him hold it all the way down to like hell in a cell or something. And have him have non-stop knock down, drag out really great 15 minute IC title matches in the middle of the card. Because when given that kind of spotlight, he is an MVP in the ring. And now is the time where WWE fans need to realize that this guy can go and he can go. He can fight Cesaro, The Miz, Dolph Ziggler. 
He can fight Sheamus. He can fight Kevin Owens. You can get an amazing pay-per-view match out of all of those competitors. Roman Reigns would do brilliantly against all of them. And then why not be the person who manages to finally overcome him? Why not have that person be Dean Ambrose? Dean Ambrose will then take the Intercontinental strap through till WrestleMania. So, as in real life, again, I don't feel comfortable booking around it. Seth Rollins goes out with a knee injury before Survivor Series 2015. And instead of the tournament, we have a fatal four-way for the vacated title. And that fatal four-way consists of Alberto Del Rio, Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns, and Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar wins the championship, and this is the first time that he and Roman Reigns have a little bit of a stare down. They never really managed to get into it properly because of the Fatal 4-Way stipulation, but we start to picture that match. Brock Lesnar takes that title. Obviously, he's going to keep it until WrestleMania. And now, this is when we get the Roman Reigns Royal Rumble win. Finally, one year on, Daniel Bryan got the storyline he deserves, so fans aren't clamoring for him as much. Roman Reigns has been proving himself in the mid-card. He's proved himself last year at WrestleMania. I genuinely think with all of this new context, fans would be really up to seeing Roman Reigns win the 2016 Rumble. This leads to Reigns versus Brock at WrestleMania 32, and it can't be worse than him versus Triple H. God, I was there. My first mania. F From that point on, Roman Reigns is one of the top guys. He is your champion. And I know a lot of people are going to be disappointed that this wasn't how to book heel Roman Reigns. But you, you didn't need it. He'd been a heel. He had been in the heel shield, the shield. He'd gone through that and emerged as a cool babyface. He'd done the whole rock thing, you know. They become a cool heel. They then turn their targets to baby faces. They debuted looking stupid with their turtlenecks. They'd become cool heels. Then they became cool faces. He'd already done that. He didn't need to do it again. The only reason you'd ever need a heel turn is if you drop the f***ing ball in the booking in the first place. If you become insistent upon this one guy system and don't let any amount of organic storytelling or fan swell of support sway you from a plan that you've had in place, damn it. That's the stuff that crippled Roman Reigns' character. If you don't book him like that, then fans will see him for what he truly is. A very charismatic, very talented wrestler that belongs in the upper echelons of WWE, which of course he will ascend to once again when he returns, whenever that may be. So that is how I would book Roman Reigns' rise to the main event. What did you think? Let us know in the comments. What other things would you like me to fantasy book? And while you're at it, please do uh, like and subscribe to Parts of Unknown. Click on the notifications because it all makes a difference. And if you enjoy the videos, please do let us know by clicking that subscribe button. I'm Adam hailing from Parts of Unknown, and we'll see you next time. And if you're looking for more great content from Parts of Unknown, check out Laurie's Explained Trilogy on The Fiend. The latest video is out now. It's brilliant, exploring horror movie tropes, how The Fiend compares to your favorite slashes, and why that Hell in a Cell match didn't work. Head over to our channel homepage and check it out right now.